Many of our subscribers don't see our videos. Make sure that you click the notification bell. This video is made possible by our loyal Patreon supporters. Visit patreon.com. And if you haven't already, follow us on social media for tips, tutorials, giveaways, and daily inspiration. All right, and hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wellness Plus Podcast. This is your guest host, Ryan, speaking. Uh, we have today Kevin Johnson from the Zero Gravity Institute with us. Uh, we're going to talk all about floating today and, I mean, tons of other stuff that I'm super excited to get into. Cool. Uh, thank you for coming in, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to meet you. It's awesome to have you in here. Nice to meet you, too. Um, we were kind of talking before, obviously, we, we got started how you got into the whole world of floating and mm -hmm. how you got started in that and it's obviously become a, a huge part of your life right um so do you mind kind of going into that again because i thought it was, it was pretty interesting yeah yeah um maybe uh before i do that maybe it would be helpful to describe for people what a flotation tank yeah, is yeah for right? sure because i i know that like for a lot of people they know about it but also there's still a lot of people out there that don't so. yeah of course um so uh, a flotation tank is a light proof and soundproof enclosure and it has um there's various styles of float tanks, but they all basically do the same thing. So traditionally, a float tank was like a, a, a rectangular box, four feet wide, four feet high, eight feet long. And um, since then, the, the shape and the design of float tanks has changed. Uh, now, now they make something called a pod, which mm -hmm. is kind of an egg-shaped uh, enclosure, and it opens like a clamshell. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're cool and they're, they're space age and they look really, really yeah. neat. Um, and then, uh, there's also what we call a float room, which is the, the style that we have at zero gravity. And so a float room is a larger enclosure. So our enclosures are six feet wide, eight feet long and seven feet tall. Oh, wow. So, so a lot bigger. So it's like this, a small room. Yeah. And, but they all basically work under the same, um, concept. So in the bottom of this enclosure, there's, there's going to be 10 to 12 inches of water. And, and depending on the, um, the number of gallons you have in there will determine how much salt you put in there. And we, we use Epsom salt, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, it's, uh, in our particular instance, there's, uh, 350 gallons of water and there's 1200 pounds of Epsom salt. Oh, wow. So this is what gives it, gives you the buoyancy in right. there. And, um, and then we heat that solution to a very specific temperature, what we call skin receptor neutral. So it's 93.5 degrees. This is the temperature at which your skin doesn't register it as being hot or cold. Okay. It's just neutral. Right. And so uh, what you do is you, you take a good shower. You step right from the shower into the flotation tank. You don't wear any clothes, no jewelry, nothing that will distract you or, or call attention to the body. Mm -hmm. um, and then you close the door behind you, lay down in the solution. As soon as you lay down, you're just going to float to the surface just like a cork. You, there's no effort on your part. You're, you're really floating in like the top two or three inches of mm -hmm. the solution. And after a few minutes, the lights and the music will fade down till you have complete silence, complete darkness, no temperature, and probably most importantly, no gravity. Mm, right. Right. And this is a in, you know, in, in uh, my view of it, this, this issue of uh, no gravity is probably the most powerful effect that the, the tank is having and we yeah. can get more into that. So, so that's kind of a basic idea of what the, um, the flotation tank is. Cool. Um, the way I found out about it was, um, in the mid eighties, 86, uh, I got out of school and out of college and I went out to Los Angeles to work and I had recently seen the movie Altered States. And that's a, um, that was directed by Ken Russell. It was made in 1980, and it starred William Hurt as this Harvard scientist who um, he went to Mexico, visited the Huichol Indians, and he brought back psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> and then he went into a lab in, at Harvard and wanted to study these mushrooms. And one of the ways that he did it was by taking them and getting into a flotation tank. Oh. So um, this immediately captured my attention, sparked my imagination. I was a psychedelic kid, so um, I loved the movie. I thought it was, especially for its time, I just thought it was really cool and innovative. And but I didn't understand that the float tank that they were using in the movie was a real thing. I thought it was just a mechanism, just a prop for, right. the, for the movie. And uh, so I didn't really think much about it. And a couple of weeks after I arrived in L.A., I was flipping through the L.A. Weekly. 
And I stumbled across this article that was talking about this flotation center that had opened. And right there was this picture of the flotation tank, exactly like the one they used in the movie. <laughs> At that time, there was only one company making flotation tanks, a company called Samadhi. And, uh, and, and so I recognized the tank immediately and I was like, oh, that's from that movie. And so I called him and I made an appointment to go in and float. And I, I, I was only 19 at the time. Mm -hmm. So the, the feeling that I had when I came out of the tank was something that I had never experienced. I, there was no context for it. I felt so calm and centered. I mean, think about what you're like when you're 19, right? Like right. You're just you kind of, you're all over the crazy, place, right? Yeah. <laughs> And all of a sudden I get out and I'm just like, I'm so focused. I'm so centered and just like this, this sense of well-being. Um, I know now why that happens and we can get into that. But at the time, I just didn't really get it. And I, I, um, I went back to my apartment, changed clothes. I went down to the beach and I just, for hours, I just walked up and down the beach. And I was just like, just enjoying this feeling. And I couldn't really put my head around the idea that something as deceptively simple as a dark box full of warm salt water had elicited this kind of feeling, this experience that I was having. And so the next day I called and made another appointment to float. And uh, I went back a couple days later and I, I floated again and uh, same kind of results from it. And on that visit, I was lucky enough to meet one of the owners. And uh, I just... I just went crazy on him. I just had so many questions. I wanted to know everything about floating right then, you know, and, and, uh, by the end of our conversation, he was like, you, you, you should just work here. You should just take a job here. You can float as much as you want and get into it. And so I did it. I, I, I took him up on it. And so, uh, yeah, I, I started floating a lot, started floating basically every day yeah. for the first couple of years. And, and, uh, it was, uh, really now looking back on it, it was a pretty important time in my life. It really, pointed me in a new direction with the way I was thinking, the way I was acting, the way I was speaking, everything, you know? Yeah, for sure. Do you know, do you know like where floating was founded sure. or how it was, yeah. like where it even came from initially? Yeah. So the, um, the initial idea from the, for the float tank was conceived of by a, a neuroscientist named John Lilly. Mm -hmm. And, um, in 1954, Lily was working at the National Institute of Mental Health. Okay. And the prevailing theory at the time was that if the if you could successfully block all sensory input, mm -hmm. if the brain had nothing coming in, nothing to deal with, the the prevailing theory was that the that you would just go into a light coma, that like the brain would just stop functioning. It would just drop into like just taking care of basic necessary body functions and then that, that would be it. Hmm. And uh, so Lily set out to um, sort of test this theory. And so he started working with different designs and different ways that he could um, could successfully block out all, all sensory input. And some of the early iter iterations of it were hilarious. Yeah. Like, <laughs> laying face down with this big apparatus, the breathing apparatus on your face and a, 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 a water skiing belt around your waist to hold you up. <laughs> You're laying face, <laughs> face down, down in, a, in, water. In, a, in a big, uh, basically like a watering, big round watering trough, <laughs> like not at all sensory deprivation. And, and then he made one that was a, a, a vertical cylinder and you wore a diver's helmet, like those big brass bell helmets. Oh my gosh. Old school. Like with the, the tube coming with out the, the top. With the tube coming out the <laughs> yeah. top, right? Like it's practically a car. <laughs> cartoon. Um, again, not really sensory deprivation, right. but, but he, but he was inching toward it, you right. know? And then, uh, um, along came this guy, um, named Glenn Perry and he, he's kind of a lesser known figure in, in the whole story, but he's actually the one that encouraged Lily to, um, move away from using sea salt and, and using Epsom salt because the, the, um, Magnesium sulfate is just a uh, provides better buoyancy and it, and it's muscle relaxer also. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Right, so it, it so it helps like relax your muscles and get you into a calmer space and um, uh, and so Glenn Perry put his input into the thing and and between the two of them they they came up with what's called a Samadhi tank, which was the very first commercially produced flotation tank. Mm -hmm. And you know when they when they started doing research into it, they, they discovered that it was something wholly different than what scientists theorized would happen, that actually when you 
when you take away the sensory input, the brain opens up in this whole new way. It starts to function in this, this, this whole different way. Yeah. And, um, you know, primarily what, what we've learned over the years is that you're, you're taking about 90% of the workload off of the brain and the central nervous system. Right, so a lot of this just has to do with taking gravity away. Yeah, just because. We, yeah, because I would imagine a lot of work is like your brain keeping yourself oriented with gravity and all these different forces pulling you, pushing you in different ways. Right. Yeah. There's balance. Right. Right. There's there's you know being able to hold on to things without dropping them. But even even uh, probably more importantly, when you're you know if you're sitting at home in the most comfortable chair or you're in bed, you know, sleeping in your most relaxed state. You're still dealing with gravity. Right. You're still dealing with temperature. You're still dealing with sound. You're still dealing with light. Right? Yeah. And so uh, with the flotation tank, we're, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting, just getting you in the tank. Like suddenly 90% of the workload is gone. Yeah. And this allows the brain to reallocate resources to doing background work that it doesn't ordinarily get to do. Right. Right. Is it at all similar to when you go into really deep sleeping states? I know obviously when you're in deep sleep, you still have to deal with gravity and a lot of different functions, but is, is it at all related to that or is it still just completely in, different? In some ways it is related to it in, in that your, your brain activity slows down in the tank the same way it does when you sleep, right? Okay. So, so we go from this like very you know, super active uh, brain state like the one that we're in now, which is called beta. Right. And then as you relax a little bit, slow down, you get more into a meditative relaxed state. That's called an alpha state. So mm-hmm. this is, uh, you're, you're measuring, in a beta state, you're producing 12 or more cycles per second of brainwave activity. Okay. Uh, when you're in an alpha state, you're, um, you're producing roughly eight to 12 cycles per second. Then the brain slows down a little bit more. You move into a theta state. This is the one that we're usually in when we're dreaming. Right. This is like five to seven cycles per second. And then below that is the delta state, which is, you know, four and and less cycles per second. This is a very uh, deep, deep state of awareness. And for most of us, you know, we're falling asleep during that time, so we don't get to experience that. But uh, in, in the tank, it's a similar sort of, uh, transition that you, you as as you're relaxing and slowing down and, and and cutting off outside stimulation, like the brain relaxes very quickly and you move down into these states. And these different states of awareness, states of consciousness, are actually where the magic is. Yeah, this is where the good stuff happens in the tank. This is where we get into you know doing the the deep work. Yeah, I bet. So what what kind of like you're talking about getting into these deep states and mm-hmm. doing some deep work. So what kind of I guess benefits are people do they start experiencing? when they're going through these different levels of consciousness and throughout their float. Right. Okay. So, so whenever I talk about floating, I, I, I tend to put, um, the potential benefits of floating into four categories. Mm -hmm. And, um, so the first one is just stress reduction and relaxation. Like right. It, that's just going to happen because yeah. the environment is such, right? Yeah. Is that um, even for people? Because some people I feel like would get, do they not get it all freaked out? Or is it, does it kind of go away pretty quickly? It happens, right? Like people do have anxiety about what they're doing. Right. Just because it's kind of They might weird. be a little claustrophobic. Yeah, exactly. Or the novelty of the thing is is keeping them on edge, right? Yeah, exactly. But, but, but we learned that that um, with practice, so floating is a practice, mm-hmm. just, just like similar yoga to like a meditation, or or meditation mm-hmm. or going to the gym, right? Like we don't, we don't go to the gym one time and go, okay, well I'm in shape now. I don't have to go back there. Right? <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> That'd be great. And floating is the same way. Like, you, you, you know, we, we look at the cumulative effects of floating. Mm-hmm. It's not your first float or your second float. It's your 20th float, your 30th float, your hundredth float, right? It's like, um, we're, we're, it, it, it's it's not going to just happen right off the bat for everyone. For some people, they go in, they go deep right away. It's yeah. beautiful. They get it. For other people, it takes two or three times to relax, let the novelty of the situation go away, right. calm down and start to feel safe in the tank. Like sometimes the tank can be such a foreign environment that people are just, they will not relax. Yeah, of course. But after you do it a couple of times, you're like, okay, this Kinda is get it's safe it. in here. Yeah. Nothing's gonna happen, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so, um, so that, that 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 stress reduction and relaxation is like is a, a real critical part of it. Then, then um, 
as we talked about the so the second category of benefits is is the the physical healing and and physical rejuvenation that can happen in the tank. Mm-hmm. So we talked about the workload, ninety percent of the workload off the brain and the nervous system. That allows the brain to reallocate resources that it was using to deal with and process all this incoming information. Now that doesn't have to do that, it can reallocate those resources to doing background work like cellular repair and healing the body. And, and, and so that's why a lot of athletes are yeah, really drawn ask, to it. Yeah, we can Quick recovery after workouts or competitions, quick recovery with injuries. If you've if you had a surgery, like anything like that, you yeah. know, it's like it just literally just allows the body to reallocate resources to doing that job. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, too. It's just pretty amazing. To get physical yeah. benefits like that. Have they done any, are there like studies or tests that they've gone through to see yeah. what exactly is going on in the body? Is it literally just is like circulation improving? Or? Well, yeah, certainly circulation is improving. There is a there's there is a um, a vasodilation effect that happens when you take gravity off the body. Right. The um, the vascular system expands, and so you get better blood flow, and more oxygen through through the through the blood and things like that. So um, we know that that's happening, and uh, also just the. Uh, there's a there's an endochromatic reaction, so mm-hmm. like your endorphin levels go up, you, you start producing extra neurotransmitters, big ones like dopamine and serotonin and melatonin, mm-hmm. and so like this whole like wellness of the uh, of the body and the mind, it's just that's going to aid yeah, know, yeah. healing and recovery. Like For we, sure. we just we know that to be true, so it's it's working you know on that level. That's yeah, I, and also because I know kind of not necessarily super related, but people talk about when they fast, you go into what autophagy and it's because since you're not, you're not having to digest any food anymore, mm. your body's able to use some of that extra energy that normally was going into the whole metabolic process to go right. through and clean the cellular like, uh, damage and go through and do a lot of repairing. Right. So I would imagine it, it's gotta be kind of a similar process when you take all of that like you said, all of that 90% of that different stress and work yeah. that your body's going through. I'm, I'm not familiar with that process, but that um, resonates with me just because I know that how the body's working in the tank. That, mm-hmm. that it sounds very logical that it would be doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's pretty interesting then. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, the third category that we talk about has to do more with cognitive function and creativity, like mm-hmm. learning new skills and things like that. Oh, really? When you, when you um, take away the the busy work for the brain, then it's looking for new information to process. Like the brain wants to be busy, of course, right? <laughs> so we we there's been studies, that, uh, especially around creativity. So we see a lot of artists using a lot of a lot of you know songwriters and. Oh, yeah. and uh, novelist and we we dancers and oh. um, you know like with dancers and athletes like the whole like visualizing their yeah routine that's what I was gonna say it must creating the neural doing, pathways yeah. of through visualization mm-hmm. like that that's really, all those fine really motor skills can still be super super well tuned just through visualization right yeah so the tank is a great place to do that because you're just you've taken away all the distractions yeah. You know, yeah, and you can just totally work through. Like, if you're a dancer, go through your whole routine. Almost, your brain can be working through that without right. anything else to worry about. Right, right. And so, those first three categories of benefit, like my personal philosophy, is that those are really excellent side effects mm-hmm. of the tank, not necessarily the primary reason that we would recommend using the tank. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. The the fourth category of benefit and the one that we're most focused on, um, it has to do with the um, the access to really deep states of um, altered consciousness, mm-hmm. right? Altered states of consciousness, and um, through these different states of awareness, the kind of deep transformative work that you can do on yourself. Right, and so th- this this is where we tend to put our focus because we recognize that it's with this uh, these heightened states of awareness, these altered states of consciousness, and the work that you can do there. It sort of naturally overflows into all these other parts of your life. Right, right, and so you get all these other benefits just from just from focusing and and strategically using these different states of consciousness. Wow. Yeah. So. What kind of, I guess, obviously, it's probably difficult for someone that's never 
floated before to try and understand what that must be like. Mm-hmm. Um, how how do you best describe it? I guess if, for people that are maybe interested in trying. Yeah. And, so, like you said, it's a practice, so it must take a lot of right. sessions to kind of get in and kind of. Is it mostly just you working with yourself, or is it helpful to kind of well, relate so, with other people's experiences? So this this is how I look at it. So I look at floating as it it's like it's a hygienic process for the psychology. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, we we know how much stimulation there is in our environment, right? <laughs> We're like we have smartphones and big screen televisions and cable and yeah, it just goes on and on and on and traffic and music and lights and sound. And I mean, it, it, I read this article not long ago that said that at any given moment, there's 400 million bits of information available to the brain. <laughs> And and I was like, no way. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. that's a lot, that's right? That's insane. But but just e- even in this super controlled environment that we're in right now, yeah. Just take a snapshot of of how much information there is available, right? Right. So the color of the wall behind me, the color of my shirt, the color of the desk, this microphone in front of me, <laughs> yeah. the lighting coming in from the side, the air conditioning system, so that you got air movement, you got color, you've got light, you've got all these things. Like even just in this one space that we're in, yeah. there's a lot of information for the brain. Now take that out into a busy city street, go in downtown Austin or LA or New York or like, Right, and then think about how much is going on. Yeah. Cars going by, and hundreds of people, bicycles and people, around. and all the different colors and sounds and yeah. smells. And I mean, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, four hundred million bits of information doesn't seem that out of the realm of possibility, right? right? But the problem is that none of us has the ability and capacity to process all of that information. Mm-hmm. And so what we tend to do is we select the information that's most vital to our immediate survival, and then the rest of it, we just stuff it down below our level of consciousness so that it doesn't matter, so that it doesn't have an effect on us, so, right? So right. we don't have to think about it. So we deal with what's important, like don't step out into traffic, yeah. right? Like put the food in my mouth, like, so right? We, so we, uh, we're, we're surviving on right. one level or or another. The problem is that as we stuff all that information down and like all the the leftover energy of all of this unresolved experience, this unprocessed experience, it begins to leave a residue on the lens through which we're seeing the world mm-hmm. and how we see ourselves and our place in that world, right? So we get in the flotation tank we strip away all the stimulation, all of the distractions, and it gives your brain a process. It's like defragmenting a hard drive, Mm -hmm. right? Like you start looking through the nooks and crannies of your storage system and you go, okay, this was important and I need to file this over here. This, this was completely not important. We're just gonna throw that away and never deal with it again. Yeah, And throughout this process, we're clearing the lens a little at a time, one little bit of residue away at a time. Boom, boom, boom. Suddenly, we start to see the world in a, in a different way, in a much clearer way. Yeah. So now we're making better decisions. We're having better personal interactions with people because we're seeing it all more clearly. Mm-hmm. We're not operating through this dirty windshield that that's, <laughs> have a, has us guessing at what the right decisions and what the right actions are. Yeah, that makes sense. Right? So in, in, this, in this sense and with, the, with this philosophy in mind, I can see where eventually floating will be considered a, a health breakthrough, like a public health breakthrough. And it's may, maybe not as poignant as like clean water or you know, antibiotics or antisepsis or something like that, but, but on, a, on a, a personal health level. I think it's a real breakthrough. I just don't think the world has really recognized it yet for what it for what it really is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And especially um, kind of with the way technology and the whole world is just getting I, like crazier. Yeah. Like, because you used to at least if you used to you know even a hundred years ago, um, you had to deal with all those factors every day Mm -hmm. in cities even or maybe a lot smaller scale but there's still a lot going on yeah but then if you were like you know you go home and you could at least you couldn't float necessarily but you could relax a little bit more you didn't have a cell phone 
right. and email and social media and TV and right. Netflix and video games and like all this like more light and stimulation that's like constantly bombarding our brains that we like are almost addicted to a lot of us. Right. Right. And so all of our downtime has turned into all that. Like, Busy time. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. even almost more stressful on your on yeah. your brain it seems it's a great point i mean if you look so look at it from this point of view like from a from a human uh from an evolutionary point of view yeah. right so we, we've been anatomically modern working with this body and this brain for about two hundred thousand years for the vast majority of that time we had a lot of downtime we had a lot of relaxed time there were tiny moments of fight or flight mm-hmm Right, but but for the most part, we spend our days like foraging, looking at plants, figuring out what's food, what's medicine, what's uh, poison, what's dye for our fabrics, what's you know, like yeah, sim- simple stuff, no no big stress involved with it, or for that matter, just sitting on the edge of a grassland waiting for dinner to walk by, <laughs> yeah, and then like there's this quick moment of fight or flight where we we're like killing an animal or or some survival some necessary survival event was happening, mm-hmm. and then we went right back into into a relaxed state, right, and now here. So look at this this 200,000 year range that we're talking about and consider that it's only been in the last two decades that we have all the issues of modernity oh, like yeah. suddenly coming into play. But we're still working with all of that with a brain that evolved in this completely different setting. Yeah. And then we ask ourselves like why are we in this frantic state? Why are, why is everybody always in this heightened fight or flight sort of thing? Why are we so stressed out? Why why culturally do we have so many problems and why societally do we have so many problems? And it really is just overload. Oh, it's yeah. just that's what that's at the root of it. It's just the overload. And and as human beings, we've always sought out altered states of consciousness. Yeah. Since the beginning of time, like for whatever reason, you know, little kids do it. They, yeah. they spin around in circles and make themselves dizzy. dizzy. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's a natural part of 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 our humanity is to like seek these altered states. Why do we do that? You know, there's obviously something that's very important there. There's ob- obviously there's this. Uh, this innate understanding that like something positive happens there, some work happens there that makes us feel better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And kind of like you were saying with everyone feeling so much more stressed and like anxiety, like anxiety has got to be through the roof now. Yeah. Yeah. And so people are really trying to, I mean, it's becoming pretty epidemic really because it's getting so bad right and you know depression levels all these things are just really skyrocketing and a lot of people are struggling trying to figure out how how to solve this issue right um and like the pharmaceutical route is doesn't seem to necessarily be working particularly well no (laughs) right no Um, causes as many problems as it claims to solve yeah it just doesn't seem to be a good long-term solution for at least most people right um so Sounds like like we need something that is is a more of a legitimate solution that that is going to provide real benefits, right? Um, and so it sounds like obviously floating could be a, a huge huge part of that. Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, the larger sort of view of what you're saying is that, like, like human beings have a a tendency to see themselves as disconnected from their source from from their we lack a sense of belonging mm-hmm. in uh, in a lot of ways. Like not not only like between people and in communities and and in in community structure, but just also like a, a connection to the divine, a connection to spirit, a connection to source, connection of God. However, you want to talk about that. Yeah. Right. And and it, a lot of times it's just because we're so overwhelmed. There's a lot of people controlling our thinking. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you look at social media and and the applications that we use, like these things are highly manipulative. There's just literally a few hundred or maybe a thousand programmers in Silicon Valley who are right now controlling the way billions of people think and the way billions of people perceive the world and the way billions of people act to one another. Yeah. And this promise of 
you know, this interconnectedness through social media and through the internet and everything, it, it, it said it was going to bring us all together. And really what it's done is to isolate us. Yeah. We have less connection. We have less personal connection. We have less one-on-one time with each other. Yeah, 100%. And it's all being filled in. The vacuum is like sucking us in. And, 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 and this, this, this promise has is, is not turned out to be true. And in fact, this, this infrastructure has created has become very unreliable. Mm-hmm. So we're at a point now where we have to ask ourselves, like, if that infrastructure is going to be so unreliable, what is it that I need to change in order to be healthy and happy and connected? Yeah. Right? Yeah, And, and, and the tank is just one of many methods that, that we can look at for, to, to realize that those possibilities. Yeah, definitely. Um, and kind of like you're saying, how it has almost disconnected us, although it seems as though we're easily connected, and we are in some ways. Like, we can obviously, like, I was actually talking with someone the other day. Like, it used to be if you made plans with someone, um, and it was before email or you had only a home phone or maybe right. a, no text message. Yeah, exactly. Right. None of that. Right. If we had plans to meet, you know, next Friday, if we were going out to the park or going on a hike, whatever we were doing, made the plans, there's, you, the plans are pretty much set, and you'll both meet there hopefully at the same time, wait right. around, find each other, and then you'll, you know, enjoy your time together. Right. Now, you can be, there's a thousand different reasons that you could cancel. Right. Right? And right. you could cancel it at the drop of a pin, because all you have to do is send a text, and be like, hey, right. I can't make it. Right. Um, because something else came up. Or even when you go on the hike, then you, a lot of people, they're still on their phones. They still have yeah. all these other things it's where crazy. they're still not even necessarily spending that time right. with, the, with the person, with nature, you know, out there enjoying more real things, really. Right. And so I feel like that's, that's another just huge issue is that people don't know how to really, really connect because it's right. kind of been replaced by a little bit more of a, I don't know, like a synthetic connection where people... Because, like you said, those the the apps are there. I mean, they're coded perfectly to addict you to keep you us know, coming back, and you yeah. know, yeah. And so it's. I yeah. think it's totally just kind of altered how we connect with people, right? And and I think that's a huge, huge issue. Yeah, and our, our patience for each other <laughs> has become almost non-existent. I mean, if you and I are supposed to meet at the trailhead at three o'clock to take our hike, and I'm not there at three. You know, three oh two. You're texting me like, "Where are you, man?" Yeah, Colin, I'm like, leaving. <laughs> yeah, and it's like before it was like, well, I don't know, maybe some traffic, or maybe had to drop something off somewhere on the way, or like, yeah, I mean, you know, quite we, a few was, things could. Yeah, could things were me. a lot more flexible, and it's like this this technology is like just making us so rigid. You know, yeah. we're just we're forgetting. We're just we're forgetting how to live, or like being d- dominated and ruled by this by the technology. And it's just growing pains. I'm quite sure we're going to get past it. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Because when you think about how much has changed, even just in the last twenty years, sure. Like going from having you had you know television, radio, and you had phones in the form of maybe a home phone, a pay phone, and that was all. I mean, that's that was huge, right? But then in you know fifteen years, we've gone from that to having like computers that were stronger than computers that sent you know spaceships into outer space yeah. in our hands, right? And so it's just, yeah. I mean, yeah, imagine the adjustment that you have to make. And like you said, uh, after 200,000 years of evolving in a completely different environment to take us and then just enter all these drastic changes that completely just mm-hmm. manipulate our, like, how we act and the, our environment around us. It's just, yeah, yeah it's to be expected that it's going to have some growing pains, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, think, think about how demanding it is. Like, you know, people get angry with you. If you don't answer your phone when they call, <laughs> yeah, they don't care that you have a life. They don't care that you might be in a float tank and can't answer your phone. <laughs> you may be on a hike and don't want to answer your phone. Yeah, uh, maybe you just want to know what that person has to say, and then you want some time to think about it right. before you. But we have no patience with each other. Yeah, no. right. It's like I know you've got a phone, <laughs> yeah. and I expect you to answer because I'm so important. Yeah, that I want you to respond to me immediately. And it's quite shocking when people realize you're not that important, man. It's like if it takes me an hour or two to get back to you, that's tough. Yeah, right. You're on my schedule now, right? Yeah. I'm the important one, not you. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Though, so we all treat but, each other with a little kind of weird edge on it now. Yeah, you know? for sure. 
Yeah, because yeah, people are always thinking about that. Like, I know, I know you can hear me. Yeah, I know, you know I'm here. Right. And I yeah, left you a message. Man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's an interesting way of looking at it too. Is it does almost make you more, uh, more. I don't know if selfish is the right word, but like, you think about what, everything that the other person is doing to waste waste your time, or like, right. You're not responding to me. Like, why aren't? And so it is. You kind of start looking at it a little bit more egotistically, a little bit more just kind of self centered wise. Yeah. As opposed to understanding, like everybody is. It does have lives outside of and it doesn't yourself. make anybody a bad person for no, that right no. it's like we're all just adjusting to it to yeah. adjusting to this on demand world that we live in yeah it's just yeah it's, it's i mean yeah it's just a total everything adjustment. is on my schedule and and i like that too yeah like i'm it, not saying I mean, it all has that i don't do it or sure. whatever right absolutely because i love the technology yeah it's amazing but but you know to achieve balance in your life so that you can be healthy you have to find an antidote to all of this critical on demand in the moment, you know, high stress, high anxiety, fight or flight kind of lifestyle that's being created for us, mm-hmm. right? Like we're we're participating in it. So it's not it's not like we don't have any control, right? But we have to make time, take time out of our day to do things that reconnect us to ourselves and 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 keep us in touch with what we need and what what what's good what's good for us. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I agree. Like, it's not like I don't love technology. It's an amazing thing, and yeah. it does do so much good. Yeah. But kind of like you said, I think it is going to be kind of a process of finding how we can balance out our lives. Yeah. So that we live live happier. Because that's, I mean, that, that's really one of the biggest goals. Is like, how can you reduce any kind of unnecessary suffering and live in a much more happy state with yourself as well as your peers and those around you. Right. Because I feel like if other people are suffering, like if my friends or my family or other people, even if I see other people that are obviously suffering, that's not like it's not a good feeling for me. You know, right. like ideally you would want to re- remove as much of that suffering as possible. So if we can find ways that work for us and help balance out this whole kind of crazy technological boom we've gone through, yeah. I mean that's that's going to be ideal. Um, and 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 I mean I see that is happening. That is the natural response, yeah. right? Like there is a, 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 a certain kind of consciousness that's surfacing in our culture right now that recognizes all the things that we're talking about. Yeah, That absolutely. you have to step away from this stuff and you, you have to remember what, it, what it's like to be human, what it's like to be a spiritual entity, the, to, the, to look for opportunities to reconnect. Yeah, absolutely. Right, like you, that that is rising now too, which is a beautiful thing to see. It you is. Know, that's that's why I say I have confidence that we're gonna we're gonna be okay. Yeah, I agree. You know? But we're we're just the first generation or first age of 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 humans that are being asked to deal with this like dramatic leap in our process. Yeah, absolutely. You know? No, I agree. And I we should th- be happy and and honored to be a part of that process and and. And take seriously our responsibility, our responsibility to like find ways to achieve balance in all of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like you said, it's exciting. Like it's a it's really cool to get to be a part of these things that are happening right now because mm-hmm. it is it is incredible. Yeah. Um, when you see every like, I mean, I feel like every year it's like all these breakthroughs come out. You know, yeah. they're discovering all these amazing things that you're able to accomplish or do with new technology or. You know, even in medical fields, all these things are they're having huge breakthroughs. And it's right. yeah, there's so much good and it's I mean, it's incredible. Right. Like imagine living back when when they when you had to get surgery, if you broke a bone or something, they're just like cutting your leg off. Or they right. or there's no there's right. no nothing to numb you. You're going through like way more, way more stuff than that. Right. And I mean, yeah, now we, we got food, like we don't have to worry about food really. Right. You know, food, clean water for the most part. Right. So there's tons of amazing advancements that have been super beneficial. Right. Right. And it's also interesting to me because, um, you know, I do I do uh, a, a lot of other work outside of the floating world too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, I'm I'm involved in in shamanic practice, and it's really interesting right now to see how science is addressing some of the more archaic ways of doing things and and there's a bridge forming between them like right now you know physics is learning to describe a lot of the a lot of the things that um shamanic archaic shamanic culture 
accept it as truth. That's right? pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like it's not that it's not that technology is always moving us uh, away from those more archaic systems. It's it's actually now kind of circling back around and picking it up and saying, oh, well, the reason that that shamanic technique worked is because of, you know, whatever, that, a change in the, the in vibration and frequency of, of, of matter or mm-hmm. this person's experience or whatever. Yeah, right? It's yeah. like um, there, there's all these interesting bridges being formed. And uh, I, I just find that fascinating too. It's, it's, it, it um, sort of reveals that, you know, we look at, at, time is like this linear thing and uh, everything in our, our lives is based on this idea that like we're here now and then we're moving only into the future. Mm-hmm. But, but really physics tells us that like time is all around us. It's not just a linear thing that past, present and future exist all at the same time. Yeah. And, and, um, and that opens up a whole lot of new possibilities in, in my view. Right. Like I think when we're doing things like meditation, flotation tanks, um, trance work, breath work, uh, plant medicines and psychedelics, like these are all ways that we use prayer, fasting, meditation. These, these are all ways that we tap into the field of information that's available to yeah. us out there. And this brings new insights and new ideas and new philosophies. It brings those things um, in, in into the present and and um, brings clarity to these ideas, you know. Yeah. So well, I think we're in a super super interesting time. Oh, for sure. And yeah, like you said, it's cool that all like so many of these practices are ancient. Like you right. said, there's things that people were doing like thousands of years ago. Right. And now we're able to use technology and science to basically just understand why it is like right. why it is that they do actually work or what it is that they're doing to us Mm -hmm. and like why we experience the different side effects and benefits of things and which is pretty interesting um yeah when i look at when i look uh throughout history at different like spiritual practice and practices and, and meditative practices and religious practices you know the idea of going into darkness going into solitude has always been there. Yeah, like so 100%. so many practices. It was like go into a dark cave and spend four days there fasting and meditating and praying and whatever you know. And it's like the flotation tank. I just see is like an extension of that. Mm-hmm. Like it's an it's a it's a new technology, a newish technology for for doing the same time honored practice. Yeah, of for like sure. Going into darkness, into solitude, eliminating distractions detaching from the outside world in order to receive insight, to receive information from the field, to, you know, uh, process experiences. It's amazing. Yeah. Right? yeah but yeah. it is, in in general terms, a very new technology for doing that that, that same that old sort practice. of practice. Yeah, yeah, it used to just be a cave. <laughs> yeah. You know, now, now you have this sweet, I guess yours is, you said, a room mm-hmm. or a pod of sorts mm-hmm. that you're able to go into, and it almost, it just takes that, experience and you're able to kind of push it one step further by really fully removing right. everything right which is yeah i mean that's incredible yeah. and then kind of like i mean the same thing with religious practices with meditation mm-hmm. all those yeah same thing people have been doing that for thousands of years right and i feel like it almost especially with um different kinds of like fasting and things like that it almost like dipped for, it felt like it maybe dipped for a second maybe 15 20 years ago um, at least, I don't know, for me, like looking at it, it seemed like it wasn't super popular. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe it just has got, I, I think it's gotten more popular now, but sure. that could just be maybe because I've kind of learned more and gotten more interested in my in it for myself. And so I've started surrounding myself with people that are interested in it, so I just hear about it more now. Mm-hmm. But it just seems like for the public, a lot of these things, like even like something as simple as fasting, where it used to be, like I remember growing up, you had your food, your food pyramid. Right. And, right. you know, you said you had to eat, you know, <laughs> this many servings of grains. Right. This many, like all these things. And now it seems like that has been totally kind of thrown out. Right. And, you know, it was always, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You have to eat three meals a day, you know, all this. And now it's, there's a lot of research and people coming out talking about how important it is. I mean, fasting has so many different benefits. Right. And so it's like interesting to see these, like you said, older practices that are kind of, 
coming back and people are realizing like, yeah, these are actually really, really good for you. Yeah. Which is, it's cool to see. I think it's because information travels faster mm-hmm. these days because we have podcasts. Yeah, of course. We have all this technology at our disposal, the, the, the internet and just communication devices in general. So, so when new things come up, when people discover new, new things, it's like it travels really quickly, mm-hmm. which is really cool and really beautiful. Um, I think on a larger scale, kind of what you're talking about though, too, is that, um, you know, we looked at, uh, if you look over the time span of human history, like we, we had very much, uh, our religious and spiritual practices were very earth centric Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until, I mean, really until about 12,000 years ago, it was, you know, animism and shamanism. That that's that was it. That's how the earliest forms of religion and spirituality were expressed. Mm-hmm. And then about twelve thousand years ago, we start to see things like carvings and totems and representations of deities and things like that. And then at the onset of Christianity, like that was a, that was a real suppressing force in all of that. Like all of the the earth oriented practices were kind of suppressed and and demonized and you know and and put down mm-hmm. in in uh favor of this more dualistic viewpoint of the universe of it's there's me and then there's god and those are two separate things mm-hmm. right and so it kind of it kind of wiped out a lot of what human beings relied on for for our spiritual and, and religious viewpoints now oddly enough with technology and the spread of information and the spread of ideas and the spread of different philosophies, we're seeing a shrinking of organized religion in mm-hmm. a pretty dramatic way. Yeah. And and we're seeing people's minds being opened up to like other viewpoints, other ways of thinking, more non-dualistic approaches to their own spiritual health. Mm-hmm rekindling that sense of connectedness to the universe to source and 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 then we're seeing the 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 physical health benefits the mental health benefits the psychological benefits of that new kind of awakening and new kind of thought processing so we're really in a really weird time of transition right now yeah yeah you know? for sure and it's super interesting to watch absolutely yeah yeah it's i mean it is very interesting and so like Kind of like you're talking about the, the shamanism. Mm-hmm. So, because some people, I don't know if everyone knows completely what exactly shamanism exactly even is. Um, could you kind of explain a little bit more about, like, so where where would you say that this, this the shamanism that you at least that you practice with kind of originate from, or is it just kind of a? I, I so I I I I don't think that that shamanism is one thing. Yeah. Right. Um, uh. I think to understand shamanism, you have to understand animism Mm -hmm. first. So animism is the idea that all things are animated by a single source. Mm -hmm. So um, if if you want to look at that in, in like a traditional religious language that like God is the source of everything and, and, um, and he, and he created all of this. Um, from an animistic point of view, a shamanic point of view, there is source, and all things are a manifestation of source. And then if you want to get into a real modern sort of description of that, you know, physics tells us that there's dark matter, mm-hmm. and it is matter, but it has no form. And then string theory comes into play, and that matter starts to vibrate. Mm-hmm. And by de- dependent on the frequency that that matter is vibrating, it manifests into a wooden table mm-hmm. or metal or a human being or an apple, right? So right. It, it's all the same source material mm-hmm. vibrating at a different frequency that determines it, how it manifests, mm-hmm. right? So that, that's like, that's. Coincidentally, the idea of animism and modern physics. <laughs> that right? is interesting. This is, this is that bridge that I was yeah, talking yeah, about earlier, exactly. right? It's like that we're seeing these things um, that are that are uh, very parallel sort of ways of thinking that come from two completely different origins. Yeah. Right? That's what's fascinating too is that yeah. you see that parallel despite being 
like you said, very different origins. Yeah. And so shamanism, in my view of it, is it, it's about, um, and this will vary depending on the practitioner that you talk to about it, but from my point of view and, and the practices that I work with, shamanism is about controlling vibration, mm-hmm. controlling frequency. So whether that's the the vibration and frequency of a person's energy, the energy of a person's experience, something physical going on in their world, and then shamanism just teaches us the tools to manipulate that energy, manipulate that, that vibration, to change the frequency of a vibration that's not serving you, that's, that's something negative, mm-hmm. and changing that vibration into something that's good for you and something that's positive, or clearing out the energy all together mm-hmm. and, and shamanism gives us different tools to uh to accomplish those things okay yeah and you were kind of saying i guess like music or using mm-hmm. some kind of sound type therapies i assume would be a huge way of doing that yeah so one thing that you find when you study shamanism is there's some some things that are universal or nearly universal to all shamanic practices. And one of the things is, you know, repetitive sound. Mm -hmm. So uh, a rattle, a drum, uh, in the, in the Amazonian cultures, they use, uh, what's called a shakapa, which is like a bundle of dried leaves or palm fronds or whatever that, um, sound a lot like a rattle, just kind of a shh, 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 shh kind of mm-hmm. sound. And, and you'll, you'll hear like repetitive drumming, repetitive rattling. Um, uh, we're doing the same thing when in modern, in the modern era when we're using binaural beats. Yeah, that's why that's I was right? going to kind of ask about We're controlling it. brainwave activity by giving a constant pulse, mm-hmm. right? And so here, here again is the archaic world and the modern world are actually expressing the same kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And then, in, and then, and then it gets into like you know chanting and, and how the voice is used, or a gong or chimes, right? Like all of these things, ultimately they come down to vibration and frequency, and and uh, and so I think those are the things that you can say are kind of universal or nearly universal about shamanism. But then once you get into r- ritual and ceremony and dogma, then th- that that's where you're going right. to have things Tons that like start things. to pull away from each other. And yeah. maybe they're not as easy to lump up right. together when, when you, when you uh, start talking about those details. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I was yeah kind of curious about. It's interesting yeah. that that's like the core belief, though. That's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and Th- like that, that's my view of it. Right. Like, I, I, if you talk to like ten shamanic practitioners, some you're people are going to be different. probably get you know at least nine different answers yeah, to that of course, question. Of you know, course, one or two people might might agree on it. That that just really comes from my personal experience and the work that I've done in my life. Like yeah. that's that's if I have to like simplify it, mm-hmm. that, that's what I see. It's very it's it's very simple. It's controlling vibration and, and frequency. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. And then kind of like you're talking about with the binaural beats, because that's uh-huh. something that's kind of gotten pretty popular now, too. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, Have you used binaural beats at all, or do you? Oh, for, for years. Years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, because yeah. they, they do they somehow, do they help your brain kind of achieve different wavelengths like you were talking about earlier like how does it how do, is it just yeah. the same thing with some when you listen to a binaural beat what you hear is an oscillation right and you, you hear that the oscillation is happening between two frequencies mm-hmm. right and so the difference between those frequencies is going to determine the brain wave that your uh the level of activity that your brain settles into. Okay. Right? So if you're trying to achieve a theta state, which is um, five to seven cycles per second, then and you play two tones that, um, uh, you know, let's say, for instance, one, one, of, one of your tones is uh, 220 hertz, and, and the other tone that you're playing next to it is uh, 225 hertz. Mm-hmm. Right? So what you're hearing as dissonance, like you're hearing two notes, two tones that don't match each other. And that little wobble that you hear between them, that's, that's the dissonance between the two notes, between their, their frequencies, the, the, the space between them, if they're five Hertz apart from each other, then, then the brain is going to hear that 
oscillation at five cycles per second, right. that's going to move your brain into a theta state. Oh, okay, okay. Right? So that's, that's like very the, interesting. that's a general concept concept behind binaural beats. Again, that's something that's been used over time. Like sound healers know that. Right, the the people who who use crystal bowls and their voice to do sound healing, mm -hmm. they understand the 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 mathematics at play there and the the sound theory that's at play there. Like that's how they're making it happen. That's how they're moving you into an altered state of consciousness. The same thing when a shaman chants to you, a shaman sings an ikoro to you. Like that's what they're doing. Like they're controlling frequency. They're controlling brainwave activity. Wow. See, right. yeah, that's pretty crazy. I mean, that's yeah. like super cool. Yeah. Especially just to to kind of find out what exactly is right. kind of almost the explanation behind it. And 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 binaural beats are not new. Right. Right. Like this this technology. Um, I worked uh, back in the in the mid '80s. I I did a um, a research project with the Monroe Institute. Do, mm -hmm. do you know? Uh, I've, yeah, the I've heard of the out Monroe of body so. uh, research group. Um, I think. I mean, I, it sounds very familiar for sure. Yeah. Uh, so Mon uh, Dr. Monroe uh, invented a, um, a program called the Gateway, and it was um, by using sound and tones and frequencies, controlling brain waves and put you into a brain state that was, that was uh, very conducive to allowing you to go into an out-of-body experience. Oh, wow. And so he was doing the very, the very same thing. You know, he had what was called a hemisync and, and so hemisphere synchronization, right? Mm -hmm. Like using tones to synchronize the left and right hemispheres of the brain because he, through his research, understood that most out-of-body experiences happen when the left and right hemisphere are synchronized. Oh, wow. So he developed a synthesizer that would, first of all, synchronize and get the left and right hemispheres working at the same rate and then slow the brain down and put you into... Uh, different states of awareness that were more conducive to eliciting this out-of-body experience. Oh, wow. And this is something that he started working on like 40 years ago. Yeah. So like things that we look at as new now uh, are not so new. They, right. they, they were ideas that were started like the float tank back in 1954 mm -hmm. and Hemisync and you know all these different ideas that didn't really see the light of day because there was no way for that information to spread. Right, yeah. And we see it as new now because we've just entered the the, the information age yeah. where it's like that, that that kind of stuff just goes around, you know, gets viral and it, the whole world knows about it by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, I mean, that's But we've amazing. been playing with it for a long time. That's incredible. Yeah. Is, so they, they're still kind of utilizing that kind of practice now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. The Monroe Institute's still active. active. In fact, there's a there's a group here in uh, in Austin that, that does a lot of out-of-body oh, wow. uh, experience research and... It's kind of it's kind of like a uh, it's kind of like a meetup kind of group. Yeah. You know, it's just people that are doing it on their own. They're doing dream work. They're doing out of body work, and then they get together and compare notes and talk about it and stuff. That's cool. Though. We see a lot of them at the float center because yeah, I'm sure. the float tank is a great place to to do that kind of experimentation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is um so like at, at your at the float center, does it? Do you guys almost kind of have like a community? It feels like there, like do, oh, do you yeah, see? Sure. I, I would imagine there's a lot of the same people coming through, and it's it's yeah. very kind of community oriented. I would imagine it is. Um, so, uh, one of the ways that that we're a little different at Zero Gravity Institute is um, we go out of our way to make your experience there a private and personal experience. So even though we have four float tanks operating and so we have four float tanks and we have three treatment rooms where we're doing like massage therapy and Reiki therapy and sound therapy and all kinds of different things. Cool. Um, so, you know, there can be several um, clients in the building at the same time, but we're very careful to um, not have you passing each other mm -hmm. in the hallway or end up in the lounge together or whatever else. Like when you come in, you really feel like you have the place to yourself. Oh, cool. And, and, and we, we do that for very specific reasons. And mostly it's just because we want that. We want you to feel safe. We want, we want you to feel like you have the privacy. We want you to feel like this space has been made um, special and sacred as a place for you to go and enter these deep states of consciousness and do this kind of deep transformative work. Mm -hmm. And and then we offer some assistance and guidance for people that are ready to like take their floating practice onto to a next level. Gotcha. Right. So in the beginning, 
we're really allowing you to just kind of have your experience and we don't really get too involved with it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, when you're at that point in your floating practice, there's not a lot of community going right, on, right. right? Because you're not seeing each other in the hallway. You're not comparing notes. It's like you float and then you're gone and then I float and then I'm gone. Mm-hmm. And, and so we don't, we don't get into a lot of interaction. And this is purposeful on our part. We feel like in the beginning of your float practice, you need the time and the space to develop that practice. Yeah. But at a certain point, Everybody hits this, what I call the what next moment. Mm -hmm. This is where you're like, okay, I've done this a lot. I'm spending a lot of time and money doing this floating thing, but what am I, what am I supposed to be getting out of it? What am I supposed to do with it? I I recognize that my life is getting better. I recognize that I'm calmer, more relaxed, more focused, better new skills and all this stuff. But I'm having this sense, this awareness that like there's a deeper level of work to be done here. There's something else to accomplish here, but I don't know what it is. Nobody's ever told me what it is, right? Right. And this is where we step in and that and we start, you know, offering some some more guidance. So I've yeah. developed a program called Transformational Flotation mm-hmm. where we give people a, a, a very um, concrete set of of things to work toward and ways to um, quantify your progress. Oh, cool. Right. That's very cool then that you're able to kind of help guide people through that process. Once you've given them, obviously, like you said, the time to work through the things themselves and get to that point. Right. And then you can step in and start offering guidance and, Right. You know, help achieve these next levels and really give more of a direction there. It's important when people start floating to let them do it at their own pace. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of reorganization and cleaning and and stuff that needs to be done just at your own pace. And and what what's interesting is that um, when you first start to float, uh, you, you 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 may come in there for one of many reasons so those reasons happen on a spectrum. Like it could be chronic pain. It could be anxiety. Uh, it could be just curiosity. It could be a desire to explore consciousness, states of awareness. People come in for all different kinds of reasons. Yeah. Right. But eventually some, somewhere along the line around float three, four, five, six, people have an epiphany. They have some experience in the tank where they they experience a deep altered state of consciousness that they didn't see coming. They didn't expect it. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, okay, wow, this is different. This is having a really profound effect on me. That's when they get really curious. Mm-hmm. That's that's when you'll see a person like really start to get into a really consistent floating practice. Okay. And what happens during that time, that that early time, you know, their baseline is, you know, maybe here at like two or three, right? And they float, and after their float, they feel like they're up here at like five or six. Mm-hmm. And then Days go by and the effects of the float start to wear off and they start moving back toward the baseline. But the more they float and the more consistently they float, the baseline starts to change. The baseline starts to get up here around four or five. Right. Now the experience in the tank is going up to six or seven or eight, right? Yeah. And so they, um, they, uh, over time, they start to feel, they start to forget that the baseline that's now at five used to be at two. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, that's when the what next moment happens. That's when people start to wonder, like, it's about opportunity cost. Okay. I'm spending time and money <laughs> doing this thing. Would my time and money be better spent somewhere else? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people will go away from floating. Right. And then about six months later, they'll go, man, I need to float. And they come in and they float again. They go, oh, that's right. That's right. This had moved the baseline. And now I feel like my baseline has gone back down Mm -hmm. and I have to work to bring it back up. That's why we're trying to get people to have a consistent floating practice. Yeah, I was going to ask if there was like an amount of like floating a week or something that you guys would recommend. It's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. But what we do try to um, encourage people to do is to create a consistent practice. We've learned over the years that if if your situation is such that you can only afford to float, let's say twice a month, Mm -hmm. right? Then, if you, then try to make it so that you float 
every other Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock. Right. And 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 make that it's as very scheduled as consistent. It's almost like ritualistic. As, exactly. Yeah. The consistency becomes more important than the quantity, mm-hmm. because what we've learned is that there's you your brain understands what it's doing and what it's about to do, and it sort of creates this Pavlovian effect where on Tuesday morning you wake up and you're like, oh, today's the day I float. Mm-hmm. I'm going to float today at two o'clock. Your your brain gets to work. Right away, right. your stress hormones go down, your endorphin levels go up, you start producing neurotransmitters, right? Like all of the stuff that you get as an effect of the tank starts happening before you ever get in the tank because you're practiced at it and, you're, and your brain is trained to have this response. Right. Right. So we encourage people to, to have a consistent floating practice, whatever works for you. Mm-hmm. We don't want to introduce stress into your life by telling you, you have to float twice a week. <laughs> well, that takes time and money to do that. Yeah, of course. You know? And and what we introducing stress into your floating practice is exactly the opposite thing that we want to do. Yeah. So figure out what's good for you, what works for you, and then be as consistent with that as you can be. Yeah. And you will notice the difference. Yeah. That's I mean that's cool. And that totally makes sense. The consistency is yeah. gotta definitely be crucial. Right. And it's cool that you guys are able to work with work with your clients and basically figure out a schedule or a way that works right. best for them. It's like a very personalized kind right. of thing, kind of like you said. It's like all about a very personalized experience. And and if you practice on a consistent basis, there, you, you, you will take care of all the, the kind of foundational work that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And once that work is more or less solid – then, then you will experience that moment where you, it's the what next moment, like what, what happens now? What should I be doing with this? Yeah. And that's when we can step in and start to apply the concepts behind the transformational flotation program to actually show you how to work in the tank, when to work on certain issues in the tank, and then how to quantify the progress that you're making once you get out of the tank. Yeah. Right. And then this, so this becomes like a level two sort of practice, like t- taking your initial floating practice and taking it up yeah. to another level. And that's what's cool, too, is that you guys are able to quantify it, because that's something that I think is helpful for a lot of people, too, is to be able to like yeah. quantify it, see that progress, kind of understand where they're at, and you know you're working towards these next steps. And so that's that's kind of a really cool thing that you guys help help people do. Right. And it sounds like it's kind of unique to what you guys do at Zero Gravity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a lot cool. of float centers aren't aren't that interested in right. doing things the way that we do them, right? And that, that's that's creating a set of problems within the industry that just have to be dealt with. Mm-hmm. But um, we've held really firm to our philosophy about floating, about what it is, about why you should be doing it, and, and, and about the potential that it has. Yeah. Right, because this is an amazing technology and used in the proper way, people can really make incredible progress with it. You know, but but there is um, a certain amount of guidance that's required from the flotation centers, and some people are able to offer that, and, and some people are not. But that that's also one of the goals of the transformational flotation program is to um, not only working with individual floating clients, but also working within the floating industry and working with other float centers oh, cool. to train them in this way of thinking and 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 in this way of um, consulting and and helping their customers, their clients with their floating practice. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's it's uh, the the program has been designed as much to help the individual floating client as it is to help the industry the as industry a whole. Floating. That's yeah. awesome because we're at a point where that conversation needs to start happening. Too. Yeah, yeah, because you want as many of these places doing kind of doing it the right way. Yeah, I guess would be the best way of describing it. Yeah, and 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 I don't I don't I don't think it's the only way. Like, mm-hmm. As I've as I've talked to different people within the floating industry about transformational flotation as a program, what I'm what I'm making sure that they understand is like this is one conversation, and it's the start of a broader conversation that people are going to need programs as more people start floating and more people get deeper into a consistent and mature floating practice. They're going to need programs and they're going to need different kinds of programs Mm -hmm. in order to stay engaged and stay interested and mark their progress in a way that keeps them interested. So that, because, because floating is all about perceived value. Yeah. Right. And that, and that perceived value can shift 
And, and so what, what we have to do is get out ahead of that and show people like, here's how you mark your progress. Here's how you quantify the work that's being done in the float tank. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so how would, I guess, starting off for anybody that's looking to start, would you just recommend just go find find your float center and mm-hmm. get started? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a... a there's a good resource online called uh, Flotation Locations. Cool. And you can put in your zip code and, and it'll give you a list of float centers. With You know, you, you specify the parameter. Like I want to know within 50 miles or 100 miles or whatever. Um, and and it'll, it'll give you the float centers. But, you know, choosing a float center, it's a lot like choosing a doctor. Mm-hmm. Like you need to try different ones and yeah, kind look, of at, look at the out. kinds of experiences that you're having or, or just do research. Just, just listen to podcasts with different float center operators. Um, listen, you know, read articles, um, get feedback from your friends. Um, a lot of people know about this and a lot of people have been to different centers and, and tried out different things. And, and um, you'll, you'll find that, you know, a lot of float centers operate in a lot of different ways. They're, mm-hmm. they're not all they're they're not all doing what we're doing, and that's fine. Like I'm not saying ours is the only way to do it, right? But but, but each individual is going to find some place that works for them, where they feel like that's comfortable for me. I fit in. I fit in there. I can I can do what I want to do there. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because I mean, if you're if you're not interested in in um, doing the the psycho spiritual work, the transformational work that we emphasize at zero gravity, you can still come in there and float for any reason that you want to. Yeah, you know, maybe you just want to chill out for an hour and relax, or maybe you got a chronic pain or something. Like we're not turning anyone away, mm-hmm. but we do recognize that, like inevitably, floating is going to change for you. At some point, you're going to have an epiphany when you realize it's something bigger yeah. than what you anticipated. We just hope to be prepared to, you know, meet people when they hit, when they have that moment. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's awesome. That's yeah. cool. That you guys are able to kind of yeah. help provide that and help guide. Yeah. Um, but well, la- thank you so much for coming on today, Kevin. I mean, yeah. it was super interesting to get to talk to you. Um, I think it's awesome what you guys are doing at zero gravity based on what you're saying and how invested you really are just in not just kind of the face value of what it seems like floating obviously is able to provide, but just kind of the, the full spectrum mm-hmm. and kind of whole picture of really improve helping people improve. Yeah. I mean, on all, so many different levels of their health, spirituality wise, mm-hmm. I mean, the whole, the whole spectrum, which yeah. is really cool. We've just completely expanded our whole offering at our, at our center. Yeah. We, we just took over the space next door to our float center and we opened a yoga studio where we're, we're doing traditional, um, you know, like yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, there's meditation classes, there's Kundalini classes. Like there's a, a full spectrum of different kind of practices that you can do during the day. And then our nighttime, and our weekend hours are set aside for um, classes and workshops and certification programs. And uh, we do ceremony there. We just had a big Mayan New Year ceremony last week. Fr- I don't know if you knew this, but last Friday was the Mayan New Year. I did not know. It's a beautiful day to drink cacao and yeah. and uh, do a sound healing and a drum journey. And so we're doing... As, as much work as we can right there in, in our little community hub, right? You can, you can do work in the flotation tank. You can get Reiki or massage therapy. You can get sound healing. You get meditation. You get yoga. You get yeah. shamanic work. You can do you get, it all. Like, it's a pretty, pretty full range offering at this point. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's something that we're trying to do to create kind of a community center mm-hmm. for um, the, the health and wellness and, and, and holistic community in Austin, like a focal point for this stuff to be happening. Yeah. So that's awesome. Super exciting time. Yeah, and, that's amazing. Austin's so receptive to that. We're yeah. so lucky to be here. I would say it's a good place community. to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to have to come down and check it out. Please. I will. Great. I'm absolutely going to have to come down and check it out because that sounds great. And then hopefully we'll get you back on here again because I think there's tons more. That, that I could probably go about. on for hours with yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. About a couple so different love, subjects. Yeah, so. absolutely. So yeah. we're going to have to get you back on so we can talk more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Kevin. This has been great, Ryan. Thanks, yeah. thanks thank a lot. You so I'm much. really happy for the opportunity to meet you, talk to you about this stuff, and share this information with your with your audience. Yeah, I think hopefully, I mean, everyone should take away quite a few important points from this, and hopefully they'll all go check out either your float center, or if they're not in Austin, 
they'll find one near them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And if anybody needs uh, direct contact with me, any any information, anything that I can help them with, um, I, I can be reached uh, just through email at kevin at zerogravityinstitute.com. Awesome. And uh, we got a lot going on, so we got a lot yeah, to Yeah, go share. check them out. Go check them out. All right, well, thank you again, Kevin. Thank you. We're the only country in the world that separates the mind from the body. Yeah, the only country. I'm joined today by Athena Jezik and Norden. Dr. Paula Bruno. The body has a natural ability and tendency to want to heal. It doesn't have to be complicated or costly. I can talk science. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk science for sure. We do often need to supplement with magnesium. Unbalanced life. Mm. Oh my goodness. Mm. Vitally important to make sure that the entire system is opened up. Actually, happiness and suffering are states of mind. They're not external things. Do you have any recommendations for our <laughs> listeners? Do you use a tennis ball? Try a HIIT workout. You only got to do 20 minutes every day, having a practice for yourself. We're not powerless, right, to improve our situation. Welcome to the Wellness Plus Podcast.